present to Professor Rana Adhikari from California Institute of Technology. Most of us who are familiar with the theories of relativity, we know that 1916, as an outcome of uh, general theory of relativity, Einstein predicted existence of uh, gravity waves. It took nearly 100 years to real detect them. Uh, 2016, exactly 100 years later, first announcement of detection of gravity waves uh, has, was done. Uh, if you look at that, uh, gravity waves go with some adjective, uh, adjectives. One is, uh, that's the finest and uh, most accurate measurement made by mankind as of today. The second one, it, it's an excellent example of international cooperation in scientific discoveries. So we, we are today fortunate to have Professor Rana Adhikari from California Institute of Technology uh, to talk about some aspects of gravitational waves. Uh, I welcome you, sir. Professor Rana Adhikari, I welcome you for this session. Uh, I request my HOD, Dr. Uh, Murugendra Pato, we greet him with a bouquet. Uh, we also have with us uh, today Professor Bala Iyer uh, from ICTS, International Center for Theoretical Sciences. I remember Professor Bala Iyer talking about gravity waves in 2005 as a part of International Year of Physics. I do remember three slides of his. I just told him about that. First slide was just showing the universe in the visible. If we go out and see the night sky, it is very calm. You don't see any explosions. The stars, galaxies are very calm and peaceful. Same universe, if you image it in uh, radio frequencies, it is going to be very violent. The third slide, slide which Professor Bala here showed was with a question mark, what if we image the same universe in gravity waves? Today we are in a day in which we can think of doing it. Uh, I welcome you, Professor Bala here. I request my colleague, Dr. Suresh, to greet him with a bouquet. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Ajit Parmeshwaran from ICTS as a part of this uh, team. Uh, Professor Ajit, I welcome you. Uh, may I request my colleague, Dr. Uh, Renuka, to greet him with a bouquet. I, I welcome all my faculty colleagues. Uh, the most important, I welcome my student friends who are going to be the best beneficiary of this talk. Uh, maybe they'll uh, choose gravity uh, wave uh, astronomy as a uh, future career. Uh, thank you, thank you one and all, please, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, before Professor Adhikari starts his uh, lecture, let me uh, give a very brief uh, introduction to him. Uh, Professor Anna Adhikari is one of the world's uh, leading experts on the experimental physics of gravitational wave detection. And, and he's one of the uh, you know, key people who was responsible for the success of the LIGOS experimental program, which, as you know, uh, resulted in the detection of gravitational waves in, in, in a couple of years ago. Uh, Professor Adhikari is, uh, is a professor of physics at, at Caltech. Um, he did his PhD at uh, MIT with uh, Ray Weiss, uh, one of the founders of LIGO, and who is the Nobel laureate of physics for this year. And after a very brief uh, postdoc stint at Caltech, uh, he was offered a, a faculty position at, at, at Caltech, and uh, he's a, a professor of physics there. And um, so apart from his you know, enormous contribution to the LIGO experiment, uh, he's also one of the strongest uh, champions of the, the LIGO India project, uh, which is a, uh, a project of building uh, a gravitational observatory in Indian soil. And he has been investing a considerable amount of time and, and resources and effort over the last uh, few years to build an experimental physics community in India, an engineering community in India, uh, uh, which would support the, the construction and the building and operation of LIGO India. So uh, you know, let, let us uh, uh, particularly appreciate this, uh, this gesture that uh, Rana has been, uh, and been making. So without any, any further delay, let me ask uh, Professor Adhikari to give this uh, public lecture. Hello. Thank you. Um, I wonder how many people recognize this saying on the front. This is a secret title. No one. Oh. OK, a few people. Maybe it's a bad choice. Uh, I'll reveal what it is at the end. Um, so I, I think uh, getting into science, more or less these are the fundamental questions that we have 
what's happening, uh, what is the universe made of, what is possible, what's impossible, what's possible, and uh, maybe how much of those things which we think are impossible will turn out to be possible by the time we finish. And so I'll address some of these, maybe three or four of these uh, now. Um, wow. So, on to the first one. So what is, what is the universe made of? What are all of these things? This is a picture of the universe which people often show. Astrophysicists, cosmologists, though, on show. And it's not quite correct, but I'll describe it to you anyway. The idea is that long ago there was a big bang. Then there was this special time where the universe expanded basically from a single point, or almost a single point, into something very large. Uh, and the expansion was as if it's moving faster than the speed of light, which is a very uh, strange, strange idea. From then until the next hundreds of thousands of years, the universe is so hot that no molecules have formed. The radi there is so much radiation that the free particles are streaming around. And basically, before this time, we have no direct observation on what is the universe and what's it made of. At this time, finally, molecules are formed. Once molecules are formed, the space becomes transparent and the radiation can travel throughout the universe. And this radiation we have observed in the modern times, and this is called the cosmic uh, background radiation or cosmic microwave background. Since that time, which is basically the full age of the universe, 13 billion years, uh, these molecules have slowly condensed through this time in the dark ages and slowly formed stars. The, after the first stars formed, there was light. And this light propagated to us. We were able to see those things. And now we live here at this time, tens of billions of years ago. We thought we understood that the universe is uh, expanding over this time. In recent times, we have also noticed not only is the universe expanding, but the expansion is speeding up. And it seems very mysterious, but after tens of billions of years, the universe is now accelerating in its expansion. There are a lot of mysteries in this picture, and I think uh, when I began maybe 20 years ago, the people who were the senior people at the time said to me, uh, basically all of this is solved, we understand how the universe is built, and we understand all of the pieces. But today our picture, after much more experimentation, is it's just the opposite. Uh, in fact, we're not sure about this beginning point, whether it was truly an explosion, or something that happened many, many times after cycles, or if perhaps uh, there was never a beginning w from a single point. This is still a mystery. This part where the expansion is so fast is highly controversial, and it's not clear that that is true either. Then this part I find to be one of the most mysterious. We had this initial part where molecules are existing, and then magically the stars have formed. And how do we go from a universe which is filled with molecules to having stars? And there are some stories for this, but none of these stories are very satisfying at the moment. So these are still things to be discovered, and, and much more. But this is just a sampling to say uh, the, the best understanding of the scientists today is quite lacking, and so we have much work to do. Um, at the moment, our understanding is this, that if we take all of the matter and energy in the universe and form a pie like this, um, the things that we can see, like this wood and myself and stars, these make up 3% of the full energy only. Something like 23% of the rest is made out of some kind of matter like this, something made of something that's heavy, something that can be touched. Still, that, this combined only makes one quarter of the full universe. The rest is in this mysterious thing which is called dark energy. It says it is dark, but um, really dark should say invisible. So when people say to you dark matter, dark energy, or you hear these things, it just means there's much of the matter in the universe and much of the energy in the universe is invisible to us. We have no way to uh, measure it other than to notice that it has gravity. So gravity allows us to say there's something out there in the universe that we can't measure. And we are a very, very small fraction of the entire universe, but also the things that we are made of is a very small fraction of the things in the universe. And that's our idea today. So uh, one of the things in the universe which is dark, but, but not invisible, is black holes. 
And so this is an image from a recent uh, Hollywood movie, but also uh, roughly accurately displayed, so calculated using real physics. So some couple of years ago, there was this movie, Interstellar, and uh, Kip Thorne, who started the gravitational wave theory group at Caltech, where I'm from, spent, uh, hmm, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 years building up the idea for this movie. In the beginning, I always like to tell people this, in the beginning, uh, I was going to be a major player in this movie. But in the end, they have this guy. Yeah. I, anyway, I will, later you can ask me, there were going to be some very cool action scenes where I do some science and save things and there's some space travel and sort of this sort of thing. But uh, this, when this guy, Jonathan, uh, not Jonathan Nolan, uh, Chris Nolan took, took over, he changed the script and I was removed from the, from the action. And as you know, well, I mean, many things happened, but the wormhole remained and uh, the graphics were improved, uh, but I, I mean, the movie was not as good as it could have been. <laughs> Just so you know. Um, in the movie, one of the main things that they talk about is the distortion of space and time around the black holes. Um, and they have planets around black holes uh, and wormholes and so on. Uh, the main topic I want to talk to you today is about uh, gravitational waves which come from uh, massive objects which are spinning around each other. And uh, just like you can have electromagnetic waves which comes from the motion of charged particles, you can also have gravitational waves which come from the motion of heavy things. Actually, it comes from the motion of anything. So even this kind of motion of this water bottle makes some kind of gravitational waves. Although, um, this mass is so low and the speed is so slow that the radiation is nearly indetectable by any, any technology we can imagine. So to make something which is detectable, we need something extremely massive moving close to the speed of light in order to make a, a little bit of detectable things. So this shows a picture of the sun and the space is curved near the sun, so this small ball, which is the Earth, is spinning around it. And this is just another picture showing some exotic piece of space-time. Uh, this equation is kind of a very complicated equation, but if you ignore the symbols for the moment, it's, it's fairly simple. It means the space-time curvature, which is this g, uh, is determined by one number, which is this thing on the front is a very, very small number, 10 to the minus 43. And this curvature is determined by how much energy and mass you have. So the more mass, more energy, more, more energy, the more curvature there is. That's the point of this equation. So this is something like the usual equation that you have for the mass and the spring. If you have a spring, uh, the amount of stretching of the spring is determined by the amount of force on the spring. And this is the same kind of uh, response to some sort of driving thing. Um, so this is um, from many years ago, I think, before there were any real signals, an artist vision of uh, what gravitational waves come from some sort of binary system. So we were able to use this type of equation uh, and this type of animation to picture things and design a system which could detect uh, this type of signal. And this is the uh, basic image of a Michelson interferometer. So you see there is a laser source, some uh, optical wave enters, there is a beam splitting device, the waves go in two directions and then recombine at this detector. This is a uh, very simple uh, measurement tool. So at this time, this is something like 2013, so it's been several years ago, we had artists to make this kind of thing, and this is also made by some, mm, maybe not artists, this is made by a physicist, so this is not as good as this one. Um, then, after we had some signal detections, we became much more uh, famous and very important people. So now we are able to make uh, video animations. That's the level of success that we are at. Um, so you can see the laser enters. This is showing the image of mirrors moving, um, and the light varies. So you can imagine it, if, if the waves were so large, they're not so large, but imagine that they are, then the light goes to this mirror, comes back, and there's a direct reflection. They recombine at this one, and then if the waves are out of phase, they have the opposite sign, 
then there's no light at the detector here. Then if something gets moved, something shakes this, or there's a gravitational wave, the waves can have, uh, the optical waves can have constructive interference, and this is how the signal is made. The, this is the basic idea. So you start with the null condition, no signal, uh, something stretches the space or moves the mirror, there's a phase shift in the optical field, in the light beam, and then you can detect the power just using regular photo detection. Um, I won't go into so many details about this, but without reading it, you, could, you should just get the idea that uh, there are many types of gravitational wave sources in the audio frequency band, something like 10 to several thousand hertz, which you might search for. And these are the various kinds of vibrations which come from the beginning of the universe, as I described, and also from the uh, oscillations and explosions of usual stars. But one of the main things that we look for is the uh, orbiting of a binary star system. Roughly half of the stars in the universe are in some sort of binary pair. So in just our own galaxy, Milky Way galaxy, we have um, something like one trillion stars. And there are something like one trillion galaxies in the universe. And of those trillion, trillion, maybe half are binaries. So there's a good chance of finding something. Unfortunately, for the signal to be strong enough for us to find, it cannot be a usual star that just has uh, hydrogen burning, that type of thing, but it has to be a very compact thing which is moving fast. Uh, so re really based on nothing except this kind of story, uh, in the US these observatories were built, LIGO observatories, and this is one in the south part of the United States in this forest, and then this is one in the northwest, which is in this, uh, uh, I don't know what we call this, brown land. Nothing else grows there. Uh, so I, I'll show you some pictures from what goes on inside. This is one of the mirrors of the Michelson interferometer that I showed. So this is the one where the laser beam comes and gets split into two pieces and goes in two different directions. This is the beam splitter. And you can see roughly the size. Uh, yeah, this, this picture is taken from the 45 degree angle. And so the size is roughly uh, something like this. Uh, some, just some mathematics to show you how this works. Uh, so this, it's in this situation, the laser beam is split in the two. And if there is destructive interference, nothing goes in this direction. And so this graphic is showing you the light power which is detected as a function of the difference in the length between these two. And so we're at the minimum. If there is a gravitational wave, then there is a phase shift uh, in these two sides. And the phase shift is proportional to the length L. And in the LIGO case, this is four kilometers. So it's made long because of this proportionality, because we get more phase shift the more L we have. Then this phase shift uh, translates into a change in power by this equation. So wherever we are, uh, the power that's detected will go like sine squared of this phase. And the derivative of this, which tells us how strong of a de detector is, this is, is just this quantity. And roughly, uh, once we get close to this minimum, the slope will just be proportional to the amount that we are from, from zero. So you, I think usually when people are discussing these things, mostly they talk about the signal, that this is a thing we're trying to measure and how does the signal get to us. And the very important point to understand is that if, if all there was was signal, then there would be no reason to make any kind of complicated device. Indeed, I could, I could just use this type of laser and make the interferometer myself. And you can make the interferometer yourself. It's quite easy um, in maybe two days if you have this type of laser pointer, you can make um, something which is sensitive to the motion uh, maybe 1,000 times smaller than the size of an atom. You can build by yourself in two days. And uh, I have some online videos you can watch that show how to do this. But the goal for this one is to get something like one million times better than that. And to get something like that, then you have to be very careful about understanding sources of noise. And one of the first ones we come to is Poisson statistics. So this light which is hitting this photo detector is made out of individual photons. 
the particles, somewhat like the particles of light. And because at any given time we have a limited number of uh, photons hitting the detector, there should be some sort of statistical fluctuation of that. And that leaves some sort of limit beyond which we can't get, we cannot get past. Um, and so the ratio of the signal to noise, which is the important thing, is, is like this. This is the signal, and then this is the noise, and then you can take the ratio to find the signal to noise ratio. And this, and this tells you uh, what's the limit for detection of gravitational waves on the Earth using uh, light signals. Well, Well, actually, so this is what, uh, when, I, when I was learning this in school, this is what they said. Uh, two years ago, I realized this, this is false, actually. So, uh, this, anyway, this is, the, this is what we thought was true for maybe 35 years. But as it turns out, uh, if you understand the quantum physics of light, then you're not limited to the statistical fluctuations which come from a random arrival of photons. And I can tell you more later if you want. Um, so the field has been going on for a long time. I think this is kind of a difficult to understand plot. Um, well, the plot made a lot of sense to me when I made the plot. But I can understand if you look at it and don't understand what's, why is this going up and this is going down or something. Let's focus just on this part. So this comes like this. Uh, and so th these are these five-sided blue things. Um, it's just saying uh, since the year 1970, people have been working on these things. And on the y-axis, there's some number which is getting smaller. And this is this number strain. And strain means uh, the change in length, like uh, 10 to the minus 15 meters, divided by the length of your system. So it's the, like thermal expansion or some sort of thing. It's a strain. So we were measuring numbers like 10 to the minus 15 in the 1970s, uh, 10 to the minus 20. Um, around this time, people started to build the large machines with the large infusion of money. And so because of the increase in the length from 10 meters to one kilometer, the sensitivity got much better. Now it's something like 10 to the minus 23. And I predict in the next few decades, we can improve uh, just slightly like this in this incremental way. Um, if we proceed as we are, but um, I'll talk about a little bit at the end. If we try some new technologies which go beyond this kind of usual limit of thermodynamics and quantum physics, uh, we can do much better. So this is now the same uh, y-axis strain, um, but on the x-axis I'm also showing the frequency. So at each frequency we have a different amount of noise, which depends on the source. My voice is mostly in this range from 100 to 500 hertz. Um, and so these noise sources that you see here are the, um, the, each of these traces is the spectrum of noise that we get from the instrument. And the data here tells you about the noise that we had on that day. So we started building the system 2014, 2015, so on. Um, and it gets better steadily and steadily, but we still have some gap between the best performance we have had and um, the ultimate performance that our machines can get, get to, and that's what we in the LIGO group are working on all the time. So I, I showed you um, several slides ago this picture of the Michelson interferometer, and here I've added just a little bit of complexity. Um, why? Yeah, so I, I'm from, um, in the US, I'm from this place in the south of the US, and people there eat, uh, uh, frogs, strangely. That's a strange part of the U.S. They eat frogs. And what they teach you there is that if you, when you try to cook the frog, uh, you should turn up the heat very slowly, and then the frog just feels nice, and then eventually it's cooked. So I'm just slowly adding the complexity to this image. So you, you won't feel uncomfortable at any part. Um, so it's just as you've seen before, but with now a few added components. Um, so these mirrors are new, uh, and this one and this one. And I'm telling you a little bit more detail about the laser. So the laser beam comes in. Um, this gold device um, modulates the frequency of the laser 
which is a little bit like the way radio signals are transmitted. It's called um, frequency modulation, or FM. Um, these frequency components come into the system. Um, one of the main reasons why we're able to do the measurement is this thing. This is an optical resonator. So this mirror has a transmissivity of 1.4%. That means every time the laser beam hits it, 1.4% is transmitted, and the rest is reflected. Given enough time, uh, if the length between these two things is built up right, then the laser power in here can build up to a large amount. Um, but it requires that when the light travels one round trip, it constructively interferes with the freshly incoming light. So that builds up through constructive interference. And then the light which goes this way is mostly cancelled because the length is adjusted so that there's destructive interference, so cancelling. So by setting up these interference conditions, we can arrange this system so that it stores quite a lot of laser power rather than the thing I showed you before, which is just one bounce. And so we are able to start with this laser of 100 watts and end up with something that has like 100 kilowatts inside of it, which is really a lot of laser power. Um, like this, this blue laser pointer, which I found um, online someplace, is something like 10 milliwatts or 15, 10 or 15 milliwatts. So it's a bit unsafe if you point it in your eye, so you don't point it in your eye. But if you point it in your eye, your eye will not explode, for example. You'll just get some burn that, that makes it so that you can't see all of the people. But if you use something like uh, 20 watts, uh, 20 watts, you burn your skin. Uh, and if you put 20 watts into your eye, then the intermediate fluid within the eye will get, start bubbling and explode eventually. And if you have hundreds of watts or hundreds of kilowatts, then pssst, there's no more eye, no nothing, no worries. Um, so we struggle a lot to get this uh, laser to be working. And you can see something like what it looks like. We have this clean room. Everyone has to wear this costume and the protection, eye protection. Um, but finally, we were able to put several boxes together and produce um, actually something like 200 watts using this system. And it looks something like this. So we begin with a commercial unit that gives two watts, and then it goes into this thing, which is an amplifier. This, each of these crystal rods here are pumped with a lot of laser energy, and this laser goes through here and then coherently gets amplified to 35 watts. That's the purpose of this part. Uh, then this part uh, is a much higher power system, um, and so it gets very hot. And this system has a lot of water running through it to take out the heat, a lot of cooling. But it's more or less the same idea. We have crystals here which serve as amplifiers, and in the crystals you shine some bright light, um, which can be al almost anything basically, but it just energizes the crystal, and then when you send in through radiation of the appropriate uh, frequency, it picks up extra power by a coherent uh, stimulated emission. So this system is some sort of resonate, resonator with this amplification, and we get hundreds of watts coming out of it. And then we use um, some more of these optical resonators in order to sort of average the light and take away much of the fluctuations. So in the end, we were able to have um, uh, hundreds of watts of, of laser power and very, very stable. And the laser is somewhat is at the heart of what, how this measurement works. Um, the laser, you can imagine, when there's a beam like this, is made up of many, many, many waves. And this is the measuring device. So we look for the fluctuations in the, uh, how long is one wave of the laser wavelength. And for this one, this blue thing, um, the wavelength is something like 0 0.5 microns. So roughly one million times less than the meter, or two million times less than one meter. And out of that, we're looking for fluctuations that are um, 10 to the minus 19 meters. So something like one part in 10 to the 13 of the wavelength of the light, which is very challenging. Um, I'll describe a bit later how that works. So j just mechanically speaking, uh, the laser beam enters into this side, uh, this is a diagram of our vacuum system. So each of the chambers is a stainless steel thing, which is very clean, and all of the air has been removed from it. Um, for scale, uh, my height, 
is, is like this, just a couple of meters. And so this part is all contained within uh, one building, which is maybe 100 meters by 100 meters. And this whole length, so there's a break here, so this whole length is 4,000 meters. And so most of the laser beam travels through this uh, part of the tube, which has been removed. This is a funny kind of unit, but it means the pressure in here is uh, 10 to the minus 9 tor, which is some kind of uh, American system of pressure measurement. It means um, one billionth of the atmosphere pressure. So that's the pressure in hydrogen and then much less for everything else. And we need this because... Uh, what can I do for demonstration? Let's see. If you're in the front, maybe you shield your eyes a little bit because the laser beam may go. Um, so when, when the laser beam travels through the air, roughly you don't see anything because this room is clean. But if you go through something like this, you can see some... I think you can see some light, maybe, from this. And this is because the water molecules are scattering the light quite a lot. Water scatters the light a lot because water is a... Uh, it has an H and two O's, like this. And so it's, it's the, the, molecule, the atoms are arranged in some strange way, and actually it has an electric dipole moment to it. And this makes it so that it scatters quite a bit of light. Um, so we cannot afford to have any uh, of those kinds of things in our system. And so this is a very expensive part of the project. We have four kilometers fully stainless steel made out of a special stainless steel which has a low amount of hydrogen, and then the air is pumped from it. Um, if the air is not pumped from it, then it's nothing bad like this, but we end up with some small amount of fluctuation which is larger than this 10 to the minus 18 or 19, which we'd like to get. Um, so naturally, I think, uh, if you live on the planet, this planet, uh, you may wonder, how is it possible to measure such a small distance, 10 to the minus 18 meters? What does it mean even? Well, the, the wavelength is like 10 to the minus 6 meters. Um, the atom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. The nucleus of the atom, 10 to the minus 15 meters. So we're talking about measuring distances more than 1,000 times smaller than the nucleus of the atom. And how, how can it be? If you just measure the vibration of this, this wood or this floor, on average, the ground is moving at the level of 10 to the minus 6 meters, one micron. So we have to remove the ambient vibration of the ground by this factor of one trillion or something. And it's done through this type of system. This is a multiple, multiple uh, vibration isolation device. So this is the floor, and we have some steel posts. Then we have this kind of device. This is a small active vibration isolation system. And this one is networked with each of these other ones. So we have four which are working together. That does eight degrees of freedom uh, real-time control. And each of these ones has three vibration sensors inside of it. So we have something like 30 sensors and eight feedback loops for the first stage. That, so that controls this upper platform. Then we have this thing. This is a two-stage thing which is two triangular tables like this. Each one of those has six degrees of freedom and also something like 15 sensors, vibration isolation sensors. Some of them are good for the low frequencies. They're position sensors for DC drift. And then we have some high frequency uh, accelerometers. And so each one of these stages controls the motion with a, a bandwidth of something like 30 hertz for the feedback bandwidth. And each lowers the motion by something like a factor of 10 to 100 in this low frequency band. Finally, below it, we hang the actual uh, mirror which is doing the interferometry. So you can see this is another view. Uh, I think this one gives more uh, a conceptual idea of what's happening. We have these spring systems and active vibration isolation, three stacked in this way. And then we have a passive system like this, which gives um, this one, two, three, four, yeah, four stage uh, passive vibration isolation. Passive vibration isolation just works like the systems in automobiles. So the automobile is a heavy thing and it's resting on top of something which has this 
uh, steel spring like this below it. And when you pass over the road, the wheels are able to move like this without shaking the passenger that much. And the more stages you have, the more isolation you have. So essentially, we are able to get to the 10 to the minus 13 meters level using this active system. And the last factor of 1 million happens through this passive system. So each stage in the passive system gives us one factor of 100. And yes. And finally, we get the, f the final factor of 1 million. So the real system looks something like this. There's some metallic uh, passive isolation. There are some wires which are holding this piece of glass. And then finally, for this final stage, this is glass, 40 kilograms. This final mirror is glass, 40 kilograms. And we're unable to use steel wire to suspend this final thing because steel has too much uh, mechanical friction in it and it gives too much noise. So this final stage uh, is made from glass fiber. So we take uh, glass fiber and we have a small robot uh, which melts the glass fiber so it starts getting pulled like this until we make a very uniform glass string and then that's attached. So finally, this final thing is made of glass welded to glass. Yes, fine, fine. Um, so this is the SolidWorks drawing uh, and then this is the final installed system. And yeah, just so you see it's real. Um, the mirror that we use is something like, well, oh, I think um, maybe 40, 40 years of technology development just to make, make this piece of glass to be good. Um, so this, this is 34 centimeters in diameter and the surface flatness is something like w better than one nanometer. So rough, roughly 10 to the minus 10 meters flatness over this kind of size, which seems like impossible kind of flatness. If you keep doing like this, how can you possibly get it to be so flat? Um, these, this initial technology came from um, the, well, I think, US, US Soviet uh, urge to shoot each other with missiles starting in 1980. They had the problem that uh, we'd like to shoot a missile from some place in the US and shoot Moscow, but not almost Moscow, but really Moscow, like in the middle where all the bad people are. And in Moscow, the same thing. They want to hit Washington DC where all the bad people are, immediately, like directly right in the middle. And how can you make sure your missile goes over there? At that time, GPS existed, but uh, you can imagine that during the war time, someone would do something and stop the GPS transmission. So you need some really um, self-sustained system. And so they made the idea of inertial guidance using a ring laser gyro. And for this one, uh, they have a device like this where the laser travels in a ring. Um, and they look for the frequency shift of this laser as the thing spins. And so in the tip of the missile, they put a laser-based system like this to, con to find out uh, basically, how much is the, is the missile moving, what direction, and so on. And so both sides race to make the best inertial guidance so they can shoot each other with missiles very well, and, which is nice. Um, they did this research and never shot those missiles, but in the end, we got this nice uh, mirror technology because they needed the laser to keep going in a circle forever and ever, which is nice. Uh, and then much work went on for another 30 years. And now we produce these things. This is a, you can tell that from the size, this is something like a, a short person like this. And this is a large, large mirror. And this is a picture of this flatness over the uh, full 34, 30 centimeters. And this is the picture of the installed system. You can see this is one, one of these mirrors in the foreground. Uh, in the background is one of these vibration isolation systems and more metal structure for more or optics and so on. Uh, yeah, so we put it together and um, in 2015, anyway, we were measuring the performance of our system and it looks something like this. This is, again, frequency on the right. So this is the audio frequency band and on the left here is the strain. So how much, uh, how much motion is the detector measuring? And so if you multiply this number by 4,000 meters, you can find exactly the displacement that's being measured. <clears throat> so that tells you something about the technology that we're using. And um, then 
we'd like to use this technology to find out um, you know, what's, what is happening in the universe. What can we measure with it? So this is the scene in our, at one of our observatories. Uh, we have a control room with many, many computers by which we control our device and get it to, to work optimally. Uh, all of these people here who are really working on the system are uh, PhD students and postdocs. So they're all below age 30, except probably this person. I don't know. I'm not sure, but I think he looks older. Um, this is the other control room uh, late at night. You can see late at night there's like one person working basically by himself trying to figure out what's happening. And m most of the time this is the situation. After the daytime, there's just the youngest people are in here doing whatever, whatever things they like. Um, so uh, sometime, you know, after 50 years of no detection, finally, um, sometime in the midnight of... Uh, September 14th, we got this signal from space, which appeared um, at the same, almost the same time in the two observatories with this seven millisecond delay. And you can see what it looks like. It starts with some low frequency thing and ends with some high frequency oscillation like this. I'll try to play the audio. Could you, could you hear the signal? Hmm. Not so good. That's, uh, I'll keep playing this until people say they've, they've heard it. Terrible. How many people here? Come on. Can you not hear this signal? All right. Yeah, it's this one. It's right in the middle. I'll play one more time. I like it. So it's that deep, deep thump. That's what's happening. And you can tell the frequency from down here. Um, it lasts just for 100 milliseconds. And the main energy is happening at 100 hertz or 200 hertz like this. And uh, this, oh, I don't know how to say, like, I think when it first happened, I didn't believe it and didn't appreciate it. But now a, a couple of years have gone by and I start to appreciate more what the meaning of this thing was really. I mean, for Einstein had predicted and dismissed this idea in 1918. And then for decades, I mean, he, he died thinking that this would never be measured because the numbers that we are talking about are too small. 10 to the minus 21 in strain is really very small. And, uh, but I think the reason that it's possible is that uh, at some point people said, let's measure this thing. And then very smart people said to themselves, no, 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 that's impossible if you have a number like you can't just put any number, 10 to the minus 77, 10 to the minus 9,500. You can't just do these things. You have to have, be realistic. And they said, well, let's look in detail at every single thing that may, blocking, may be blocking us from making a real detection. And they did and said, hey, uh, actually, there's nothing in the way of making a measurement this small. And so they were just very bold, very courageous. And then they worked hard at this. And it turned out, well, they were wrong also, because it's difficult to anticipate all of these problems ahead of time, but new people joined who were smart and uh, were able to solve all of these new problems that were coming up. And so, anyway, this was done. That's great. Um, this is just an animation of what it, what it was like. Uh, this is uh, the merger of two black holes. So this is a small one, and this is a large one. And this is seen from, from the face on. And if there were a lot of stars in the background, this is the image that you would see. The optical light would be distorted in this way as the thing comes toward us. And you can see right in the middle, it's very exciting. Right at the end, it, a small piece extends out and is a sort of thin piece of space-time touching itself. Um, let me just move on. Um, 
I'll keep moving on. Um, so people, not, not just me, other people were very excited about this. And so then the Nobel Prize was awarded for this uh, to these three guys who had been working on it for uh, many decades. And uh, time has moved on. We've made some more uh, detection. And now there's um, several more binary black holes have been detected. And early this last year also uh, another gravitational wave source which had an electromagnetic companion. Um, so our detectors are on the Earth and are finding these signals that are sort of in the audio band. There are also plans to have detectors in space which would look for signals which have periods from uh, one hour to one day to maybe the full uh, uh, age of the universe, so very large things. So let me skip a few of these because I would rather hear from your questions rather than keep talking. Um, so, yeah, as I said, there are many sources of noise, and if you have some questions about what are the real limits, I'll get into it. I just want to describe a little bit of what happen what's happening next. Um, so in this year, uh, the system is being upgraded somewhat, and next year we'll take some more data. Hopefully, during this year, we'll be install installing a system which takes advantage of our new understanding of quantum physics to reduce this uh, fluctuation which comes from the statistical nature of the light. That's called a squeezed light system. And then some improved mirrors. And I hope maybe in several years um, we'll change the mirror into a, a new kind of material, silicon, and operate it at low temperatures. Um, but th so there was a problem. One of the things when we found this first signal is we were unable to locate it in the sky better than this purple thing here. And so we knew something was happening and it was probably in the south, but uh, we could not tell exactly where. And if we can't tell exactly where, we also are not sure exactly of the uh, strength of the signal. And it's hard to associate it with something electromagnetic. Um, at the time, uh, we only had these two detectors operating both in the US. And given the size of the world, these two are almost in the same place. And so you, if you imagine, uh, instead of these two ears, if you have the both ears uh, located on the top of your head in the same place, like this, then you can't tell something about pointing, like which direction did the sound come from. So it's better to have many ears, and they should be distributed all over the body, basically uniformly, and then you can do very good, very good pointing. So we thought, um, let's put a, a detector in India, because then that's very far from here, and we can do some pointing. And also, look at all the people in this audience. Um, all of these people can come and join this project. And you saw this picture in the US. There's like five people working on this project. And already, we have enough people here to build several of these systems. So this seems like a good idea. Uh, this is something like the uncertainty that we get with the sources in the sky with just the two US detectors. And then this is what would happen with the addition of the Indian detector. And so we traveled around the country and showed this type of exciting back and forth animation and said, look, let's do this. And nothing happened, really. Um, but we then uh, made this detection, and there was a tweet from the prime minister who said, yes, that's good, let's do it. And after that, we started to have progress, and this became a real project. Um, this is one of my previous summer students, Nancy. Uh, she asked him, uh, can we take a selfie? And he said, yeah, sure, selfie is good. He seems to like it. There were professional photographers there, but he went for selfie and said, so what do we got? So this project is going on, and um, I, I don't know, I think when he asked me what's, what's the point of this project and what can we do, I said, you know, space is fantastic and the universe, you know, I went like this with my hands and he said, yeah, sure. And then I said, but we will build all this technology in India, right? Great lasers, mirrors, electronics, control systems, a huge high-tech revolution by just trying to make this project good. And he seemed to like this idea. And then uh, later people said to me that this slogan already existed, but I think uh, because of this meeting, 
now we have this. That's my theory. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so we're going on. Um, so this is some future challenges for what we need. The Indian detector is uh, on its way in terms of design and coming up with manpower and so on. And here are some things that we would have to develop in the next several years in order to make, make it better. The way we have got it planned now, the US detectors are a bit old. They've been around since 2014. And there are other ones in Japan and Italy which are being built now, but uh, when this one comes up in 2025, it will be the newest of them all. So the newest one always has to be the best, I think. Um, so we have some technologies which I'm just listing here, but um, these are all things which need high precision engineering for very good crystal growth, new laser development, new mirror development, uh, whatever this means, quantum noise. And then a lot of signal processing for doing both noise removal and for doing uh, feedback systems. Um, let me skip, just, to, just to giving you a historical note. This is the Caltech uh, Experimental Gravity Group in 1974, when this idea was just, just starting. And um, this is Kip Thorne. Um, next, standing next to him is an expert in measurements who came from Russia, uh, Vladimir Braginsky. And he was, uh, these two at the time were saying, how can we possibly do such a sensitive measurement? And uh, for really, without planning, near them were all of the other people who were going to motivate this. This is David Lee, who was a PhD student at the time. And he was thinking, um, what can we do once we have gravitational waves in, in 1974? And he thought it would happen in a few years. And then here is another PhD student of Kip Thorne's, who at the time was thinking, um, what can we do to get past the usual quantum limits of laser-based measurement? And they combined a lot of their ideas and added more people over the years, but this was something like the beginning of the effort to make these very sensitive measurements, and they always thought that they were only a few years from making it happen. So it finally took until 2015, which is really very long, but um, it took that kind of long-term vision and persistence. So, uh, yeah, as you heard before, our picture of the universe has changed over the years. So we have all of these things, gamma rays and microwaves, invisible and so on. And now, uh, I don't remember what all of these are. But anyway, a lot of electromagnetic radiation, something is purple. And the gravitational wave sky now has at least one pixel. So we are seeing the beginning of this picture is starting to develop over time. And this uh, LIGO India project that's coming up here will change this thing from a few pixels into an image, I think, that looks like this in the next 10 years or so. So thank you for your attention. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Rana, for this very exciting summary of uh, what has been happening. Um, so, uh, Rana is willing to take a few questions. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand and um, someone will bring a mic uh, to you. Yes. Sir, uh, how is uh, squeezed light uh, uh, produced? No. Oh. That's a very hard question. Mm. Let's see. Okay, I'll, I'll, this is always a challenge for me how to answer this question without making a one-hour lecture. Um, the, the way to imagine it is the everywhere in empty space, potentially there is an electromagnetic field that there could be. And this electromagnetic field has a lowest energy state. And the lowest energy state for the electromagnetic field in our universe happens to be something which is of order uh, half of the energy of one photon. So it's not really one photon, it's like half. And at all times, it has this low level of possible energy, um, but the, number, the amount of fluctuation in the energy is also of order the same amount. So there can be, in empty space, always some kind of electromagnetic fluctuation. It's just a sort of a consequence of quantum physics, which is yet another more difficult question. But this noise is always happening in space. 
And when there's a noise happening in this space and this space, you can imagine that it's coming from waves which are traveling to the left and the right all the time, like this. And so we take some crystal, which is a nonlinear crystal, meaning that if you drive it with an electromagnetic field at a frequency uh, like 100 hertz, it's going to produce an electromagnetic field at 50 hertz and 200 hertz and so on like this. So you take this crystal, nonlinear crystal, and you pump it with a lot of energy, so it's very nonlinear. And it takes these waves which are coming from empty space and turns it into things where you have fluctuations which are correlated. So the fluctuations of empty space which are truly random by going through this nonlinear crystal produce more or less uh, photons which are correlated with each other. And you're not able to escape the fact that there is still noise. There is noise in the universe, but you're able to change the noise to be either uh, noise in the measured phase of the electromagnetic field or the measured amplitude of the electromagnetic field. And we choose to put all of the noise, which is something that you can't get past, we put it all into the amplitude. And so when we measure the gravitational wave signal, this quantum noise is there, but we're only measuring the phase of the electromagnetic field because of the interference. And so all of the noise is sort of pushed into some uh, degree of freedom that we don't want, that we don't care about. Hello. Sir, uh, how do you decide the location of a laboratory like LIGO? Um, well, I think if there are no constraints about uh, people and roads and so on, then we can do just a usual mathematical optimization process and say, uh, imagine there are signals coming from space in all directions and we can move the detector wherever India we want and put it at the place where we get the maximum signal given the existence of the other, other machines in the world. But in the reality, we have some uh, limited restrictions for land use. We, we, we can't uh, put the detector in Bangalore because all of you will have to leave. So there's some practical considerations. So the detector will go into some place uh, where there is space and where it's not near something which is extremely noisy, but where people can fly to, there are roads, that sort of thing. It's more, more practical than scientific. Is uh, vac uh, dark energy vacuum space? Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer yet. It's a kind of vacuum energy, but I, I don't know any more than that. We have no experiments that are able to st distinguish between different kinds of dark energy at the moment. Well, vacuum is... In Just the empty space. Yeah. Is energy. Uh, the vacuum has energy in this case. Thank you. Okay. Sir, uh, you said you might put the detectors in space. So uh, what are the advantages of that over the detectors that we have on the surface of the Earth? Uh -huh. Yeah, in space there are no people. <laughs> so, what are the aliens. major... Except aliens, yeah. So in space we can put detectors in there almost vibration-free. So the Earth is always vibrating at the periods of tens of seconds to hundreds of seconds because the Earth is like a bell. And because of this we have too much noise. And so if we'd like to look for signals that are in this frequency band, we have to go to space. And in space, it's possible, I think, to observe signals for a very long time. So because it's quiet, you can find a signal where the thing is orbiting for three years. And by that, you can do a kind of very precision uh, mapping of how gravity works and space works. Oh, hello, sir. So I'd like to know, like, uh, as we know that, uh, it, the gravitational waves cause a uh, change in phase shift. So does that not result in, let's say, distortion in the instrument, the measuring instruments as well? So wouldn't that affect the measurement? Yes. So how do you uh, cancel out those factors? Like, on that? Hmm. Do you mean the gravitational wave will change the wavelength of the laser? Yeah, laser and even the instrument. Yeah, yeah, as if everything is changing. Yeah. So then the signal is undetectable. Yeah. Yep, you got it. So then how do you detect <laughs> the signal? No, no, if that's true, then 
I wouldn't be coming here. It would be finished. Um, yeah, something. It's something like, yeah. Of course, uh, when the wave comes through, and there's a light propagating in it, indeed, um, the stretching of the space changes the light wavelength. But what we're doing is differential measurement. So the the space time gets changed in the two arms in some separate way. But uh, and in fact, the light which is in that area also gets stretched. However, the wave that we're measuring is extremely slow. It's changing like this once every 10 milliseconds or something. And the laser light uh, gets refreshed every 10 or 20 microseconds. So the way you can imagine it is, um, imagine I have a lot of this measuring rope, and I'm trying to measure the distance here. And then while I'm making this measurement, somebody changes the size of this auditorium. Of course, everything scales the same. But now if somebody else comes in with a new measuring tape, they'll be able to measure the new distance, and so on. And so by the fact that we keep re-injecting new laser beam, the laser beam that we're measuring with now uh, was not there when the space-time got stretched. So you can imagine it like the space is now curved, and we just turned the laser on. So because we're making this differential measurement uh, once in a while, we're able to ignore the fact that the space-time uh, distorts the measurement setup, measurement apparatus. Thank you. Sir, uh, how precise should the detectors be so that we could discover the gravitational waves due to Big Bang itself? Due to what? Big Bang itself, instead of black holes in this case. Mm. Well, no one knows, because the Big Bang is a kind of guess. So maybe there's no Big Bang. But there are many theories about what the universe is like post-Big Bang. And in those, um, we have to make the detection in space, first of all. And then we would have to be more sensitive by something like a factor of 100. But that's a very optimistic picture of the Big Bang, where the Big Bang happened like this in a flash, and then the waves from this impulse are now vibrating around the universe. Okay. Um, hi, hello, sir. Uh, I heard from other, uh, what do you say, media that uh, LIGO was uh, trying to find gravitons. When it is happening? Yeah. Find what? Existence of graviton, sir. Uh, no, we are not. <laughs> no, I heard it, sir, uh, from uh, net. Uh, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, everything I, I say is correct, but everything that other people say is not correct. There's no gravitons. Uh, we are not searching for gravitons. Okay. And uh, about many black holes, sir? Uh, no, I, I think we're not looking for mini black holes either. The smallest black holes we would search for are something like 10% the size of the sun. Uh, there exist some uh, higher dimensional black holes which LIGO is trying to find out. Uh, mm. I don't think so, but we should. I like, this, I like this idea. Like four dimensional black holes. Or five. Yes, sir. Yeah, come work with us. <laughs> for sure. This is probably a good time to stop. Uh, and you have any last question, probably, yeah. Hello, sir. I would like to ask about that. In the br brightest day, the darkest night. The oh. topic. You said there's something behind it. Yeah, this is the... Oh. I heard it in Green Lantern comics. It's from the Green Lantern. Yeah. In the Green, so in the Green Lantern comics... Um, should I tell about the Green Lantern? Yeah. The, in the Green Lantern comics, um, some alien comes to our planet and says, uh, you know, whoever basically has enough willpower to make very, very sensitive scientific instruments will get this green ring. And then your job is to travel around the galaxy and make sure that people are learning physics and astronomy and so on and like doing really precise engineering for their scientific instruments. And none of this uh, halfway imprecise stuff. So the Green Lantern travels around and, you know, he has to say this oath at the beginning of the day that, you know, in 
What was the name again? <laughs> Blackest Day. Anyway, Brightest, Brightest Day. I mean, some, some sort of poem to remind himself that uh, no matter what's the situation, the Green Lanterns are there to shine their light onto this kind of scientific in, in, inadequacy and make things scientifically rigorous. It's a, it's a comic book series. Okay, that's really the last question. By the frequency of the wave detected, can we measure the distance, like how much far did the wave come from? Or where was the wa wave emerged? Yeah, that's one of the main scientific tools that essentially we use the, like the Doppler shift. And so if the source is moving from us or if space is expanding, we can tell something like that by how the wave is shifted. But the frequency of the wave at its source tells us roughly about the size. So um, uh, for a black hole, you can imagine like this. If I touch the black hole like this, the black hole gets a little bump, and then the bump travels around the side of the black hole. And the speed at which the black hole rearranges itself is the speed of light. And so you can tell the frequency of the source by doing this and seeing how long the light travel time takes. And so the, what we detected was something like 250 hertz, and that tells you the size of the final black hole. As of now, what was the distance? Like, how far was the emerged, uh, this thing, this, radiation? Um, it's like what, the first one was one billion light years. Okay, so I suggest that we sort of stop this formal question answer session, and if you have any further questions, you can, of course, come and personally talk to Professor Adhikari. So let me thank again, uh, uh, thank Professor Adhikari again for this wonderful lecture and all of you for, uh, uh, for, for, for being here. And let me also uh, thank the, the college for uh, uh, co-organizing this, uh, uh, this event. Thank you very much.